This is Thursday, June 2nd, 2016. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Gerald Rosen. Welcome, Jerry. Thank you. I'm privileged to be here today mm -hmm. and yesterday and hopefully tomorrow. Well, hopefully you'll be, you'll be around for a long time yet. May I ask when you were born? December 21st, 1924. And where were you born? In Mount Vernon, New York. What community do you currently live? I live in Westboro, Massachusetts. Your marital status? It is still married. Do you have children? We have three children. Uh, we have two girls and a boy. And grandchildren? Six grandsons. Any great-grandchildren? No great-grandchildren yet. I'd like to pause for just a second. Certainly. So that you can see the grandsons. All six? Wow. All six, and that's recent. Uh -huh. Good for you. If they ever get to see the tape, then they'll be pleased, pleased to know that I didn't forget them. They'll get to see the tape. Uh, tell us a bit about Mount Vernon growing up. It's a typical uh, town post uh, World War I, and uh, it was a bedroom community primarily for New York in those days. Uh, it was a, quite a broad spectrum of uh, religions and families, and uh, a very, very beautiful, uh, exceptional educational system. The high school was considered, and probably still is considered, one of the best. And what did your father do for a living? Dad was a furrier in New York City and uh, traveled down every day uh, a nickel on a subway. He walked there from the house, which was probably two miles every day, left the house about 5.30 in the morning, and he got home around 5 in the evening, 5.30. It's a long day, and uh, it was hard work going to a union down there. And how about your mother? My mother was born and raised in Washington, D.C., about a block off of Pennsylvania Avenue. The, uh, the building still stands. There's nothing there at this time. Uh, they keep talking about putting things on that area, but I don't think it'll ever occur right now. And did you have any brothers or sisters? Yes, I have two brothers. Both are departed. The older brother was in the Army, and my younger brother also was in the Army. And you grew up during the Great Depression. What do you remember about that? Oh, quite a bit, quite a bit. Uh, I probably started working when I started cutting grass and doing things like that, ushering in the Proctor Theater and uh, any other odd jobs uh, to sustain. And as I, as I got older, I learned how to uh, carry golf clubs and do anything else that brought in money. Uh, never really did have a, uh, any kind of uh, money from my parents. There wasn't that much around. If we wanted it, we had to go work for it. But that was okay. That was good. It's good education. Did your father uh, maintain his job as a furrier throughout those years? He did until later years. And uh, he and my mom opened up a cleaning store in Mount Vernon. but. Uh, it really got overrun by the chains, and he uh, retired out of there. And you mentioned the school system. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I had, we had regular regions tests and things like that, and uh, but we were always convinced. I don't know, maybe by the board of education. I'm not <laughs> sure that we were in uh, one of the best. Uh, educational systems around. I think it was probably true because most of the high school graduates were capable of going to a lot of good schools and had done so. During the time you were in high school, and you mentioned before the interview, it was Davis High School? A.B. Davis. A.B. Davis. Were you uh, told about events in Europe and Asia at that time? No, I don't, I don't believe we really did go into that sort of thing back then. Uh, we were 
Well, my graduating class was June of 42, so it's barely after Pearl Harbor, and uh, that probably is the reason why, that it, we as a country didn't really treat the war in Europe as we probably should have earlier. And I understand you were quite the athlete in high school. I did play on the uh, hockey team. Uh, was there a couple of years, got my letter, and probably uh, tried a little of hockey later on in life. You were mentioning you were a member of the class of 42. Do you remember where you were and what you were doing when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor? Absolutely. I was at home and uh, was listening to the radio. We, at the time, my, my mother's sister and her husband, who was a captain in the Army, regular Army, and he was in the New York Engineering Procurement District at that time, uh, were living with us. So we were all probably sitting in the living room, listening to the radio when the announcement came out. And uh, of course, it was probably maybe more shocking because of the, the captain. He was eventually retired as a colonel uh, living there and uh, what the impact might have been on him. What do you think was the impact on you? Uh, I don't know. At that point, there was much more impact than that we were going to war, and I'm not sure. I sort of suspected uh, there would be a service call, which there definitely was a, a draft service introduced and that had a, an impact on my world. You mentioned uh, your two brothers entered the military. Were they drafted? My oldest brother was. I suspect my younger brother was also. And what are, were your brother's names? Melvin was the older one and Edward was the younger one. You graduated in June of 42. Right. And what did you do after you graduated? Quite a few things. Mm -hmm. I uh, went to night school and studied automotive engineering at uh, Edison, Edison Tech, which was the technical high school. That was night school work. And uh, I grabbed uh, a lot of odd jobs, including, like I say, ushering in the theater and uh, several other little jobs. I, my older brother Mel went to work at uh, Fafner Ball Bearing in New Britain, Connecticut, and ultimately said, there's a lot of money to be made up here if you want to come up this way. And uh, I did follow him up, and we roomed together up in New Britain, Connecticut. I got a job with uh, Stanley Tool. I was a uh, uh, time and study man. In, and there weren't many men around uh, in those days. Most everybody that I worked with were girls, and uh, I, I was in the zigzag rule shop, if you know what that is. It, they made rulers back then that had a snap action in there. Well, that's what we did in Stanley there. And I was the one that counted and weighed all the work and gave the girls. They were all on piecework at that time. And in those days, I worked there permanently, I did a morning job as a, in a catering group, and I did an evening job three days a week in a bar. I ended up with about three hundred dollars a week, which was spectacular. I don't think my dad ever made more than seventy or seventy-five dollars a week in his life. But I got yeah. a got a call while I was there to be an associate aircraft engine mechanic at Floyd Bennett Field, and my dad insisted I ought to go down and take that job. And uh, I did, and he came up, picked me up, and we went back down, I took the job. And in the meantime, <laughs> Captain Jacobson, uh, my uncle, was uh, head of procurement at New York Engineering Procurement. He said, why don't you come down to New York Engineering Procurement? We'll give you a job there. You'll have a civil service rating, and I don't know what we can do, which I did. I transferred over. 
And you were still a civilian? Thank you, Perry. You were still a civilian at the time? These were civilian jobs you, you did, or were you... Uh, no, I, I, I left the, uh, air, air, the aircraft engine job. Uh -huh. I left that to go with the New York Engineering Procurement mm -hmm. District. Both had about the same government rating though, mm -hmm. at that time. And where and when did you enter the military? I would love to have entered uh, at that point in my life. My parents wouldn't sign me off. I was still 17. And uh, uh, I got into the military the day I, well, I went down and registered and enlisted the day I turned 18. And the Navy took me in on the first week or so of January of 43. And why did you choose the Navy? Uh, I knew I didn't want the Army. I guess that's the primary reason. Were you getting stories from your brothers? No, not at all. The younger brother, uh, he was six years younger than I, and we really didn't have a heck of a lot of life together. Mm -hmm. uh, we were too far apart. My older brother, uh, was into quite a few programs in, in the Army, and uh, we crossed paths while we were both in the service out in the Philippines, but, but couldn't we? We were both in Manila at the same day. He was coming in and I was going out, but um. we couldn't connect. It's a tough one because we look forward to it. Oh, wow. Well, let's get you back in New York City, January 1943. You had just turned 18, and you've just joined the Navy. Right. Where were you sent for basic training? I went up to Sampson in New York. It's upstate next to Watertown. And uh, I have to say that was the coldest place in the world. There was no heat in the barracks. It was quite an introduction to the Navy. I wasn't so sure I was making the right decision. Uh, well, anybody that's gone in through boot camp knows it's a shock in, in so many ways. They take all your clothes and then give you a lot of shots and start throwing new clothes at you. And in the case of the Navy, they threw a hammock at you, and that was your bed the first night. Not known, never having been in one or how to string it up, it was quite a humorous night, but not anybody was too happy about it. It was cold, no heat. It, it was a horrible experience. Tell us a little bit more about the barracks. How many recruits were in there along with you? I, I really, uh, really can't say. I, there were certainly at least 30 or 40 in a barracks, at least that. And we were all hanging hammocks, which none of us, all out of New York, I don't think there was one of them that ever even <laughs> saw a hammock. Except maybe in a movie. <laughs> Uh, was there anything you liked about BASIC? Not really. Um, it, it, it was good. It was good training, very good training. Uh, I think everybody looked forward to having a week off after, after you end up getting your apprentice semen pads out of the way. And what did you learn in BASIC? You learned to tie knots because all your clothing is tied up before it goes into the duffel bag that they give you, which is it's kind of interesting. The pants are all folded inside out, and the creases are all inside, and everything is rolled, which is good. And you learn how to make things very compact to get your entire wardrobe and your hammock into the duffel bag. That must have been quite a feat. <laughs> It is. It's it's packaging, but uh, and you you end up doing menial things. You have to stencil everything you own. You, there's a lot with basic that I, remains. I think it's important though because you go from a a family kind of uh, introduction into uh, how you run your life to a military one, which tells you how to accept orders and obey them and stay as a group, and that's, uh, that's important. It's important through whole life. Anything else about basic, like the physical training? No, I, I think most of the guys are all very young and all pretty strong and healthy for the most part. I 
can't imagine them accepting anybody that wouldn't be in one way or another. Did you receive any advanced training beyond basic? Beyond basic? Yes. Oh, after, after basic training, I received a lot of training. Mm -hmm. And how long uh, did basic take? It was seven weeks, eight weeks, something like that. Where were you sent after basic? From basic, we were interviewed at the end of basics as to <clears throat> our strengths, what would we like to do, and things like that. And uh, I was uh, put into uh, aviation machinist made school in Billington, Tennessee. And where is Billington? It's just outside of Memphis, and it's a, it's a naval air training station for pilots also. We had steermen trainers there uh, with uh, canvas wings and uh, by wings, which were very negotiable and handy planes to fly and to work on, and that's what we did. After the cold of Watertown, what did Billington, Tennessee look like? Oh, it was, it was great. It was March. It was a little dusty out there, but it was a great place to be on the so on the Mississippi River. Nobody, would, we had no idea. That could have been anywhere, you know. But uh, it was nice. It was into yeah chance to see Memphis and enjoy some of those things. And what were you do? Uh, well, you were in Billington Aviation Machine. They, uh, as well as being the uh, Naval Air Training Station for pilots, there were schools there for aviation uh, ordnance and uh, I I don't think there was radio school there. I don't remember, but uh, there were probably three grades of school there, and uh, I was in the aviation engine machinist mate. We did engine work, learned all about airplane radio engines and V engines and things like that. We did the work on the planes on the field and uh, got to know an awful lot. We taxied them and th did things like that. But was, was this the whole range of aircraft? Oh yes, you, you have to know all about hydraulics, you have to know all the mechanics of it. There wasn't much in the way of, of electronics per se, but the, our primary education there was engine work, hydraulic work, mm -hmm. patching uh, canvas. Seems hard to believe they were still doing canvas at that late date. Well, that was their early date, those planes. Uh, that is true. And they were good training planes. It was a steerman. Uh, they, there's still, I'm sure, some steermans up there flying. It's a very, very, very good, solid plane. And how long were you in uh, Billington? I, I think Billington ran 16 to 18 weeks, something like that. And at the end of 16 to 18 weeks, what we, happened? We were asked if we would care to volunteer mm -hmm. for aviation work flying. And uh, I volunteered, although everybody says you never volunteer mm -hmm. in the Navy, don't volunteer. I you did put volunteer. Your hand up. <laughs> and uh, we, were, we shipped off to. Uh, Trying to think where where I went from there. Well, I guess I, I was sent to radio school first mm -hmm. to learn how to operate a uh, aircraft radio. And from that, I don't recall how long that was, but we had to learn Morse code and uh, dialing up frequencies, all of that. Not too much in the operation or manufacture or repair of the radio itself. From there, we went to radar school and learned the operations and uh, the functions, how to operate, how to recognize uh, targets, that sort of thing. Uh, again, if you ask me where those two schools were, I'm not really sure I can recall where they were. 
uh, the third school was gunnery school, and then we got an idea roughly of where we were headed. <laughs> because at that time, there were uh, two passenger uh, bombers and things like that, and all had a rear, rear gunner in them. So gunnery school kind of eliminates that image that you're going to be a mechanic all your life. <laughs> And uh, gunnery school was in Virginia, and we, we were shooting, skeet shooting for target prep, moving targets, that sort of thing. We, were, we uh, learned to start shooting 40, uh, 50 caliber, 30 caliber machine guns, and ultimately were put into turrets for turret gun firing. Uh, so we had a pretty rounded education of gunplay and not sure where we fit into that picture. Uh, at the end of that series of educations, uh, I think it was about March of 43, be March of 43, we were, some of us were shipped in different areas and I went down to Banana River, Florida and uh, which is now the space station, but at that time was a naval air station. And we were trained in PBMs. I happen to bring a picture of one. Okay. PBMs? Uh, I'd be it's a twin engine bomber that flies, lands and takes off okay. on the water only. Mm -hmm. And there are roughly 11 positions on that plane. Plane is developed primarily to be bombing, strafing, and uh, safety, recovery of down pilots, that sort of thing. Plane, uh, our training flights were anywhere from four to eight hours, four to seven. It's always the only, for only the first flight was an hour flight. That was the first time most of us had ever been up in a plane. I got sick that day. That was the only time I ever got sick. And it was only when the hour was up. Okay. Once the hour was up, bingo. Okay. <laughs> but that was the only time after that I've never had a problem with uh, flying. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, <clears throat> we did fights up the coast of the Atlantic coast from Florida. We go up all the way above uh, New York and back. We did uh, flights all the way down below Panama Canal and back, and we'd go out to Bermuda and back. And we flew that Bermuda flight, and in those days you wondered where that Bermuda Triangle was mm -hmm. and if you were going down. That was a factor we were thinking. And we also looked, we, when we go out, we would scan. We were told to scan, see if we saw any wreckage or anything like that. But the basic thing was to get used to the plane, to start learning how to fire the guns at moving targets. And uh, the education was good. It was very strong and deliberate. And uh, you were given enough time to really know the plane well. In the plane, the function of most of us mechanics, and there are mechanics in ordnance guys, and then there are Seamen, straight seamen, bosun mates, that sort of thing, in the in the makeup of the crew. The crew would be, the general crew is generally a pilot, co-pilot, and another pilot, and the two pilots, uh, younger pilots, would alternate on navigation and flying, mm -hmm. and then the skipper of the plane was concerned with the uh, plane itself. The uh, crew. Uh, I became a tail gunner at that point, but the functions are because the plane is up there so long. The plane has a, had a little stove on it. We didn't have a refrigerator, but we had a stove so we could cook hot stuff and we could make coffee and hot soups and things like that because the flights were so long. And uh, everybody had more than one function, obviously. So with my case, it, it was uh, quite like quadruple because I could stand by and do re replace the radio man for relief. 
I could re relieve the flight engineer at the cable who watches the engines and checks the fuel flow, changes the fuel tanks, and all of the responsibilities that a flight engineer would have, and also do radar work. So between the guns during active duty time when, when you're busy doing what you're out there to do, and the time it takes to get to wherever you're going to do those things uh, is occupied by that sort of thing. It was my function to start the engine generator because it was up in the uh, tail section where I kept crawling to. And the, that, before the plane starts off, the, uh, you could generate, get all the radios going, get the engine started, that sort of thing. But always on the water. The plane was a seaplane, no, no. Uh, most people are familiar with a Catalina, which was a twin engine plane that was a shorter, much shorter range, and that's why they put in the PBM to go to the longer range possibility. So uh, the PBM, the Catalina, was an amphibian, so that could land and take off on water and had that capability. We never had that capability. If there wasn't water, we weren't landing properly. Mm. And did you uh, fly no matter what kind of weather? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you go up in anything. Uh, uh, the first worst storm, uh, there was another one that was even worse than that. We had to do a uh, hurricane off of um, Cape Canaveral, not Canaveral, Cape, uh, ha up around North Carolina. Cape Hatteras? Hatteras. Okay. Uh, we flew right into the eye of the storm. Uh, it was quite an exciting experience. Uh, I could not believe the winds and then to be into the eye where nothing is happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it was just an amazing experience of learning. But they wanted to know what the internal structure was, where it seemed to be heading, what are the wind speeds, and that's what we had to do. So you became a hurricane hunter. Uh, only once on the East Coast, thank goodness. <laughs> Most of the time we were just hunting for submarines. Mm -hmm. Find any? No, never. Never there. They were out there. The East Coast was hit very hard uh, by subs. It was not not good for us. But uh, I, I I'm pretty sure so, some of our planes have. But our plane, our crew never did find one on the East Coast. And how long were you on these uh, training missions? On the what? On these training missions, and when you were flying up and down the East Coast and what have you. You know, that's a good question. Uh, it had to be, I'm trying to think of how it flowed. It had to be at least eight to 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. It had to be that. Let's talk a little bit more about what you might be wearing uh, during these training flights, were you uh, in full flight suits? Oh yeah, we had, we were given a, a whole different set of wardrobe. Uh, we had the regular Navy suits, but now we included our flight jackets. We had flight jackets, lightweight, heavyweight, and winter weight Navy jackets. <laughs> All of that goes in the duffel bag still. They you know, never got rid of the uh, hammock. Uh, uh, somewhere in the family, it probably still exists. The same duffel bag? The, the, no, the same hammock. Ah, okay. The duffel bag, long gone. Oh, well, it was just many, meaning the... You know, have a putting, wife that gets rid of a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Just trying to cram the, all that flight equipment into the same yeah, duffel I, bag. Yeah, I have a, a lightweight flight... You have two flight suits with pockets and all of that nonsense. And then you have a lightweight flying jacket. Then you have a leather flying jacket. Uh, you have glasses, you have your own headset of earphones, the elephant ears. Uh, there's a, the boots are the same, shoes are the same, everything else was the same. And uh, we wore our, our dungarees uh, on flight mm -hmm. uh, and, and at certain occasions. Did you ever need the o uh, oxygen masks? No, we, no. we never flew. Uh, it was not a... Uh, the plane was not set for high flights. It was all lower end flight. Uh, I think the highest ever might have been uh, 
somewhere eight to 10,000 feet. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, that you, had, you could do hot soups and hot coffee because you had the little stove on, on the plane. Right. Uh, uh, what kind of food did you eat? Did you have K-rations or? Oh, no, no, no. Oh. We, we had canned goods, uh -huh. uh, canned fruit, canned soup, uh, anything that came in a can we could have out there. But they didn't need refrigeration because we did not have that. Okay. But uh, for the for the flight, we it was adequate. That's about all. We didn't have a, a meal cart coming through the plane <laughs> or something like that. There were no uh, when we went out. There were no sandwiches or anything like that. But. We were fed well when we came back uh, through our entire, excuse me, through our entire service period. We were treated extremely well in, in regular flights. Later, we, when we came back from uh, our duties, uh, there was at least one case of beer thrown on the plane, and we got uh, we had eggs and steak and things like that for breakfast. Uh, most of our flying was at night. I know that poses a different challenge. Take off and landings, very much so, because you know the, the waters may be charted. As a matter of fact, we when we're flying uh, overseas uh, uh, through the throughout the Philippines, we we all receive silk maps of mm -hmm. the water tides and the flows, and so that if you did go down, it gave you. Uh, I don't know if I ever felt safe having a map that told me where the tide was, but uh, mm -hmm. it, uh, it it was good to have in, in your ration. So you were given that sort of goods. We never really were, the navigator could tell you where you were going or not where you were going. It was up to him to do that. The pilot rarely was, once in a while, depending on what we had, the, probably mm -hmm. the greatest pilot we could have had. but. Mm -hmm. uh, it uh, it was built for flying, not yeah. for dining. Okay. We had four bunks on the plane, by the way, also. That was my next yeah, question. Yeah, they're canvas, can, just canvas uh, attached to uh, metal metal frames, and uh, they they were mid mid plane around in plane tanks. We had a lot of gas on the plane. And did you want to mention the name of the pilot? Oh yeah. Excuse me. That's okay. Mm. His name was uh, Frank Screws, uh, and just the greatest guy there ever was. And can you spell his last name? S-C-R-E-W-S. -E okay. He was a regular Navy pilot, non-commissioned when the war broke out, and had flown seaplanes most of his life. And when we left uh, Florida, we went to Hertford, North Carolina, where the squadron was formed, patrol bombing squadron 25, and uh, our crews were formed at that point. And we received our pilots, so I became a part of crew seven. We had uh, Ensign Bacon and Ensign Schweitzer as our pilots, and we flew for probably two months without a, a main pilot. And uh, then one day we had a call to go up to North Norfolk and pick up our pilot, who turned out to be Commander Screws. And he became the executive officer of the squadron. During the time that you were uh, doing the training flights in Florida and then up to North Carolina, did you have any indication of where your final destination no, might be? No, not at all. We okay. didn't know anything. And during the training flights, were you kept uh, apprised of events happening in Europe and Asia? Oh, I, I think we all were, uh, very much so. Uh, probably more so of the Pacific because the Navy was so much more involved in the mm -hmm. Pacific than 
than the Atlantic. Uh, and I, I think we probably all assume we would go to the Pacific. Uh, nothing in our uh, clothing or anything like that ever told us we were going to the North Pole or uh, the, the uh, Aleutians or something like that. I don't know. Sometimes they throw those curveballs. <laughs> So this takes us to around mid-1943, a little bit later. Uh, oh, much later, okay. yeah, because it was March of 44, no, no, excuse me, March of 43, excuse March of 40, me, okay. that I went into Florida. Uh-huh. So it, yeah, that's about right. That's about right. All right. I'm not too positive of the, it's interesting, yes, that I, I'm not too positive of time at that point. Mm-hmm. We'll just say a little later in 1943, you're in Norfolk, Virginia. Tell us what happened next. Well, uh, Norfolk was only to pick up uh, the pilot. screws, go back to uh, North Carolina and finish our training flights mm -hmm. and our, our crew flights and squadron uh, information, how we operate. Most, most, most squadrons, uh, and, and we were the same, we had roughly 16 planes originally, 16 crews, and each crew was pretty much uh, a stamp of the previous crew with 16, 11 guys normally on the plane. There were two waist gunners, a tail gunner, nose gunner, a top deck gunner, a pilot, co-pilot, chief engineer, a radio man, and uh, the ordnance man was up front and he ran the, the bomb site and handled all of the the bomb work and loading, we carried uh, engine nacelle bombs underneath the wings. Uh, each gunman was responsible for his bullets uh, and stacking them, making up the belts and loading your gun and making sure your gun works. You have to break down your gun or keep them clean. Tell us what happened next. We, uh, Flew the squadron across the country with one stop in uh, in Texas. There's a lake out there. I forget the name of it. And then I went to Alameda, California. And we did some flying in Alameda, probably waiting for assignments only out of Alameda, flying up and down the uh, West Coast. Uh, it was interesting. San Francisco was lovely and uh, it was a nice place to stop and, and breathe. The next was uh, the flight to Oahu and Kaneohe, which is the Naval Air Station there. And uh, that's ex we pr I think we set a record for that, for the most planes in one flight to Hawaii. And uh, we did training out of Kaneohe and around the Hawaiian Islands and uh, the Pacific. Uh, just getting the the squadron accustomed to the Pacific and the weather and things like that. Uh, it was a continuum of, of just getting to know you better, I guess. Mm -hmm. At that point, we moved out. We went to Johnson Island truck. We stopped a bunch of on Kwajalein, uh, Anawitak, uh, flying across the Pacific, doing what we're supposed to do. Primarily, those flights were mostly daylight flights. Uh, we stopped at Midway, I believe, and we did some night flying out of Midway. Uh, it turned out that our target, real target, was uh, the Philippines. We were in Lady Gulf, uh, at the peak of the battles in the Philippines. We, uh, the squadron was in three battles altogether. We, I have three battle stars on my combat air crew wings. And uh, we were uh, under attack uh, on the ground from uh, kamikazes. Uh, it, it was all the excitement of, of war that you could expect and then some. And we flew in and out of out of there, tracking the Japanese fleet on many occasions, and then uh, protecting one of the 
One of the most impressive things I ever saw was tax, Task Force 57, which as far as the eye could see was ships. I just could not believe there were that many Liberty ships, uh, military ships, uh, all sorts of ships. And uh, they loved to see us because they felt a little more guarded mm -hmm. if we were out there. There was a destroyer brackets around mm -hmm. them. But we could fly up uh, out a long time and did. Our, our flights were normally 12 to 14 hours, so that's continuous. And uh, so it gave us a, a distinct advantage for staying with the fleet a long time. And uh, probably when we were out on, on doing that kind of duty, watching the task force, there were probably two or three of us doing the, the mm -hmm. perimeter because it was so wide and big. At the time that you were in the Pacific, what was your rate? I never changed that rate. It was aviation machinist made third class. I got that coming out of uh, Millington, Tennessee, mm -hmm. and that's what it changed. The, the biggest change was we received uh, flight pay and we received uh, overseas pay, which increased the payment which was, that was good. No place to spend it. And uh, at, during the uh, time you were in the Pacific, what were you being told about the Japanese? Well, we were trained on what the Japanese aircraft looked like because mm -hmm. that was, uh, that was a care for us as to what, what we ran into, uh, how to identify what was out there. Uh, we knew the Japanese had a lot of submarines out there, and on certain occasions we were sent to follow Japanese specific ships or attack them. Uh, it varied with, with it. The predominance of our, our we were always there for uh, uh, pickup of uh, any down pilots or aircraft, that sort of thing, uh, any, almost anywhere we would fly and uh, any kind of weather, any kind of uh, landings. You take it as you get it. Right. And of course, that part of the Pacific, it's tropical. Were you prepared for that? The worst storm ever to this day was in Hilo, Hawaii. And uh, I was on uh, aircraft duty. I never left the plane alone. There was always somebody on duty. Uh, for me, it was good because I knew how to operate the radios. I knew how to turn on the generator, and I, I loved it there. I could listen to Tokyo Rose or, or whatever. I never get a stateside broadcast, of course, but I could get music and things like that. Tokyo Rose was uh, very, very interesting. But uh, I was on aircraft duty when the hurricane came that hit Hilo, and it was this. It was just incredibly windy, and the waves were up to 40 feet. Wow. And, I mean, it, and the plane was going up and down 40 feet. It was, it was scary. And uh, I got a call from the base that they were sending a motor whale boat out to get you because it wasn't safe on the plane. I said, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it was just... To get on the motor whale boat when the waves are 40 feet, is a, that's a feat that I'm lucky I survived. I, I don't know how I did that because the, the plane and the boat are passing each other and you have to catch them to jump out. Worse than that is you can't leave the plane open. So there's a baffle, wind baffle outside both of the side hatches. What you have to do is you have to leave the baffle out so you can hold on to something. You have to close the hatch behind you, and you're out on the uh, tiny edge with your feet holding on to the baffle, waiting for the, the boat to come by you to jump off of that into the boat. It's scary. Uh, we did it and got out of it, but it was incredible when you see in the bottom of the boat and the mm -hmm. propellers are going and you're and you don't know whether the two are going to bang together. It's, that was quite an exceptional event. I hope the plane, you and the boat survived. Everybody survived. Good. We didn't lose anybody or anything. 
You were mentioning earlier when you were in the Leyte Gulf um, facing kamikazes. Yeah. Anything more about that? No, it's a, it's a scary time uh, when you're on board. You got your planes out there. We got guys on our planes. Uh, the kamikazes were being shot at. They come in low and there's a distinct problem that a gunner on two ships facing one another are gonna be having their guns shooting at one another when a kamikaze plane comes flying in between the two of them. And, and that happens. So it's, 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 you can't be up on deck uh, enjoying the view when something that's going on. But we all try to stay on deck because if something happens, you don't wanna be below deck. And you also mentioned uh, you were out there on rescue missions. Do you remember any of them in particular? No, uh, I really don't. Uh, we've never had anyone in that serious a mode that we had to go after. We we did go after one group that went down off of the coast of China, and uh, we couldn't find them. And I knew the pilot very well, Stevens. He's he just passed away recently. In fact, most of the guys are gone now. But uh, uh, of that crew, half of them got off the plane okay, and went to shore. We they had communication, and a submarine came and picked up one of them, took him back to Australia, and. He was to give them where we could meet up and pick them up again, but they were never picked up, and uh, three of them were beheaded, and maybe two of them came back alive. That was it. So tell us what happened after Lady Gulf. From Lady. We went up to uh, Manila. I think I was, I'm pretty sure I was in the first group of Navy guys and they were from our crew, our pilot, our, from our squadron, we went into Manila Gulf while the Army was fighting its way, the first cavalry was fighting its way through Manila. And uh, we were given orders, a couple of guys and I, uh, from our crew, uh, and I'm sure Pappy Screws was the one that volunteered us. He would do that. Uh, to go in, and we'd have to go around the, the basin, around the edge of Manila, to check out Cavite, which is the Navy seaplane, old Navy seaplane base, which the Japanese had been using, to see if we could use that, if the water was OK to land in, if the ramps were available to bring the, car, the planes up out of. Our planes could be brought ashore on a ramp. We had not amphibia gear, but wheels that could attach to the side, and they could pull them up with a tractor. Mm -hmm. So I believe, I'm pretty sure, we were the first Navy group into Manila, and, uh, and we could hear the battle in front of us almost, and uh, they were dead dead soldiers, Japanese, no Americans, so dead Japanese all along the roadway and everything. We had uh, Garin rifles and uh, we all carried 38, so all of us uh, and the plane had, the plane had Garin and each guy, we all carried 38 pistols, six shots. Um, when you were landing the PBMs in say a harbor or um, even some kind of anchorage, were you worried about mines? No, not at that point. Uh, usually the Navy has mine sweepers and things mm -hmm. combing it. Uh, there are certain areas they would probably have put mines in. We, have never, we didn't run into it in Lady Gulf at all. We weren't sure about Cavite at all, mm -hmm. but it was an active base for them, so I was doubtful that they would have done that. And then when they were moving out, they probably were moving so fast that they probably didn't take any time to do any of the damage they could have done. They didn't destroy the ramps, and they, they did nothing in the water. That uh, The water was nice and clear. We could land planes there and feel very comfortable, which is hard because 
in a lot of the places, uh, Mindoro, Mindanao, and we flew out of most of those areas, you don't know what's in the water. You have no idea. And we lost planes on landings and takeoffs with reefs and all kinds of debris in the water. I don't know how many planes we lost that way. And uh, the only thing great about that was we get spare parts to repair the other planes because there was nothing in the field to replace them. That was a part of it that is interesting, is how do you fix a plane on the water? And uh, we were trained in that, unfortunately. Each plane has a set of tracks that hook onto the wings with a ladder, so it allows you to get down and a ramp. It all hangs out. It, it's assembled pretty nicely. Not very, it's pretty flimsy, as a matter of fact. <laughs> and you take your tools and stick them in every pocket, but you don't want to drop them because there's no place to recover them. You take off the cowling and pass the cowling back and rest it up on the plane. And we could work the engines and the carburetors and all of that, which we did. Uh, we replaced carburetors. We didn't do any major uh, cylinder replacement or anything like that on the water. Uh, we had uh, support ships that could take a plane up on the deck pick it out of the water, put it up on the deck, and do that kind of heavy work. Uh, we did the light work of checking, uh, maybe to check uh, spark plugs and change that, check the wiring, do the rewiring if it was needed so that your nuts and bolts don't fall, wire, mm -hmm. fall away. But that was all done on the water, and, and uh, it wasn't a steady base, but you learn not to lose any tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would that would have been a little bit of a drop now, wouldn't it? <laughs> so that uh, again, as I say, it, it, it appeared, as far as I can recall, anyway, that most of the uh, landing area, the main well, the main one was Lingayen, which was pretty well cleaned out, and of course Cavite, which we checked out originally and landed, and I had no problems. Those were our two primaries uh, through the first and second battles of the Philippines. Uh, we received a Philippine presidential unit citation for that and a, a Philippine Liberation Medal for being there. And how long were you in the Philippines? Mm, I knew that question was going to come up. Uh, you know, it was a long time. Yeah. It's about, but uh, if I work backwards, uh, Captain Screws put me up for officer's training while we were there, mm -hmm. uh, which was why I loved the guy. And uh, I was the only one out of the squadron, as far as I know. Maybe later on there were others, but of the original squadron of men, I was the only one that was ever mm -hmm. put up for that. And I was very pleased about mm -hmm. it. So mm -hmm. I, if I work backwards, I got out in 46, and I had two semesters of school in there. So that would bring it back to 45, probably a year, a little over a year in okay. the Philippines, which and sounds about right. Mm -hmm. And it was just about this time you just missed your brother. Yeah, I, I knew he was coming. He said he was coming, and we kept, uh, we kept the wires and letters going quite a bit. And I finally got a, an arrival date, and he did come in on that date. But that was the day that I was flying out in a Mars, which is a very large seaplane, uh, thanks to Captain Screws. Uh, uh, he got me on it, or I'd have been on a boat. <laughs> but, uh, and that would have been a long trip. But uh, we were both in Manila at the exact same time, and uh, there's just no way to find them. Oh, rats. <laughs> I, had, I had the liberty. He didn't have the liberty to oh. do it, but I had the freedom. Once I was out, out of the squadron, and I was on my own. I had my papers, and I, I could do whatever I want as long as I made the flight. So this brings us to around 1945? Yeah. Yeah, okay. We went to uh, Pocatello, Idaho. Uh, I forget the naval air station. There's a naval base training station like boot camp. And there were probably, I think there were probably seven, 8,000 sailors, Navy men there, vying for 1,500 officer training jobs. 
and we were given all sorts of tests, uh, primarily all educational tests of backgrounds and things like that, and uh, tests for math, English, and uh, very little in the way of physical training or physical responsibilities. It was mostly a schooling thing to identify 1,500 trainees. I was fortunate enough to be selected in that group, thanks to A.B. Davis. And uh, a group of us, uh, probably about 70, I would guess, were sent to the University of Missouri. And that was kind of funny. Missouri never had a Navy unit to begin with, so there were our 70, and then there were another 30 or 40 from school ROTC that were coming into the regular Navy and were part of this program, which was called a V-12 program. It was a Navy program for officers training. It was not ROTC. These were ROTC people, reserve, in, and they were in school. So uh, we had about 150. This, the captain was a a submarine captain had no idea about it. <laughs> the chiefs were all from overseas and came in. They had no idea. They knew how to run a, a, a group, but they didn't know anything about school. And uh, we were all put into our freshman class. It didn't make any difference whether you had college or not. Everybody was put into a freshman class at Missouri. We took over a brand new girls' dorm it had just been completed and uh, took over the whole thing. It had a dining room, it had cooks and everything. And the Navy had us uh, three, I think we were three in a room at that point. It turns out, we're, and some great friendships were built there. I, uh, that's why I, I stopped with Captain Screws because uh, his putting me there probably set me up for the rest of my entire life for what I did, how I did things. The uh, group there was very close, and it turns out even closer because nobody wanted us. Fraternity guys from college couldn't get into their own fraternity there. They just didn't want any piece of it. We couldn't play in any of the, the graduate sports or the senior sports. Uh, so we couldn't get on a football team. We couldn't get on to any basketball team. We couldn't even play in intramural sports. The, the school just didn't want us. I don't know why they took us, but maybe because Truman was president, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but we were there. At the end of the first semester, they told the Navy, Oops, you forgot to do your dorm renewal. You, we don't have any place for you guys to stay anymore. The Navy took us and said, put down in your order of preference what school you'd like to go to in the United States. Well, you know, you never get your first choice anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. So I put down UCLA, which I thought was a private school because it should have been Cal, uh, Southern Cal would have been the obvious choice. My real choices were Harvard, Yale, and Dartmouth. Dartmouth because they had a great hockey team. Mm -hmm. And one of the guys from my Navy unit when we were at Missouri had played on the hockey team, he says, I can get you on the team. I know Coach McCurdy and I can do that <laughs> thing. So come, come to Dartmouth with me. One guy was from Illinois. Come to Illinois with me. They were, had, we had good friendship. Everybody got their first choice. Including you? The guys went to Notre Dame, including me. Mm -hmm. I went to UCLA. Uh, it was quite strange. Well, UCLA had no idea what to do with me because everybody was out of the freshman year and I'm still in my freshman year of school. So they, they put me in uh, naval training classes, regular, because it was Navy, uh, all the Navy training classes were, were there for navigation and whatever else we had to learn to be an officer. And uh, 
I was on my own for the other classes. Uh, I carried, I think, uh, I think I carried 22 points that year in the first semester there. I think with 19 at Missouri and 22 mm -hmm. at, uh, it was almost on a road of maybe three years in college to graduate, something close to that. And uh, it was at UCLA, it was a surprise to me, or it was a big surprise. I was uh, called up for full dress and got my uh, two big medals. I got the Distinguished Flying Cross twice, and I got uh, the Air Medal twice uh, under those circumstances. And then I became the favorite of all the fraternities, and, which I never did join, but uh, everybody knew me on campus, I guess. Uh, at that point, at the end of that semester, the Navy changed over to uh, a uh, regular ROTC kind of agreement, so the V-12 was disbanded, and I would have had to sign up for continuing my ROTC training and four years thereafter for the Navy. So I was committing like seven years of my life to the Navy, and uh, I had points, obviously, from the Navy service, and I took the point and uh, took my discharge there in California and stayed at UCLA. Let's uh, pedal back just a little bit. Do you remember uh, when in the summer of 1945 when the atomic bomb was dropped on Japan? I was aware of that, yes. Mm -hmm. And were you... I mean, what was your reaction? What's an atomic bomb? I, I was overwhelmed, and I really overwhelmed by the devastation. There's no question about the forces and the energy that were ex expanded out of that whole situation. Uh, it's so different from bombs, as I knew bombs, and guns, as I knew guns and the loss of humanity, which is something I've always been concerned about. Uh, there were so many lost in World War II um, that uh, I, th I think the, wasn't even, the second bomb didn't mean near as much as what that first bomb mm -hmm. did to me. And uh, I'm a very much aware of the loss of life, not just the our own, but around the world, and what, what exists today, which is so tragic. Mm -hmm. And how about the when Japan surrendered? Well, it's an, that was an exciting moment. It mm -hmm. ended the war very rapidly, and uh, uh, I, I experienced it just as everybody else did with the TV and the radio and MacArthur signing them over on the board, the, the Missouri, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, the war is over. Uh, let's get on to doing what we would like to do. All right, you have been. You were discharged from California in 1946. What was your rate? I go back to aviation machinist. Machinist made, made third, third class. class. <laughs> I had to get back all my officer uniforms. <laughs> Everything went back. My 38 went back. Uh, I lost a lot of good things. You're in California, and you, you, but you were still at UCLA. Yes. Okay. I stayed there. And did you graduate from UCLA? No, I did not. You I did? never graduated. Really? Okay. Tell us what happened. Oh, well, that's an interesting part of life. Uh, I had some problems in California, not UCLA problems, mm -hmm. problems that I developed, and. Uh, it just made a lot of sense to leave California, and I went back to New York. Uh, I got into NYU. I was in business school at NYU. I was doing a lot of different jobs uh, with a very good friend of mine who also had flown in the Navy as a tail gunner on a two-seater two fighter pilot off a shipboard. And uh, we went to UCLA together, and we uh, went to work for Snow Crop together, uh, Frozen Foods. And uh, 
NYU refused my Missouri credits and refused all of the Navy credits. And uh, given, given that situation, I said, well, I better go back to Missouri and see if they'll take him. Missouri wouldn't take any NYU credits. They wouldn't take any of the UCLA credits, but they'd give me all of my credits for them and let me get back into B school there. At the end of my first full semester at Missouri, my mother passed away and uh, I came home to uh, said Shiva for my family and went back to Missouri and they said they could not give me the exams and uh, had to fail me on the courses. That was the end of that education up to that point. Unbelievable. <laughs> wow. Probably in, in, in the end results, everything worked out just fine. Okay. Had a good life, a good family and mm -hmm. uh, have no re uh, no regrets. And how long have you been married? Uh, I believe 63 years. I think it'll last. Mm -hmm. And what's your wife's name? Marty, Marlene. Okay. And what did you do for a career? Uh, I went to work, I ended up living in Washington. And uh, I, I tried several jobs there. I ended up as an assistant buyer in a heck company. And the family owned a clothing store in Washington uh, on the same street where my mother was born. My uncle was running it. He had no children. And he came to me and he said, we'd like you to come into the business. Would you come in and work with us? And uh, he said, we'll take care of you. I said, it's okay, fine. Uh, you know, it gave me more money than I was making at the heck company, and uh, it was a little harder work because I had a big responsibility there. I did, I did all the bookkeeping, I did the selling, and mm -hmm. I and he did the the shopping. Mm -hmm. Little by little, I did all of the in-house buying there, and uh, he did the road buying, which was probably the mainstream of the business. We were a major customer of Joseph A. Banks. Joseph A. Banks bought that store as its first retail shop and opened up in Washington as a retailer, and the business is gone. Uh, one of my friends from the Navy, a fellow named Walter Hotz, was running an electronics business as a manufacturer's rep out of New England. And he says, I need a, a man for, for Massachusetts and New England. Would you come on board? Uh, you'll work for a commission, draw against commission. This is what this, the territory brings in. You should be able to do this much money a year. I said, that sounds fair. So I packed up my two kids, my wife, and we moved to uh, Massachusetts and uh, I was with them about a year and became an owner of that business uh, became a vice president of the business and there were some decisions made that I didn't agree to and I said uh, I don't agree with that and uh, if we can't correct it then I should get out of here they bought me out I went into business on my own, and uh, the business still exists, although I'm not in it. I, my son-in-law, Fred, is in there, and uh, they do quite well. Okay. Now, Jerry, after um, you left the service, did you join any military organizations? Uh, I belong to Jewish War Veterans now. Uh, my dad belonged, my uncles belonged years ago. I was, uh, I marched with them when I was a little kid. Uh, it's, it's kind of interesting though, you know, when, when I think back then, that was only about a 20 year spread 
from the war to I went into the war. It's only you know 1918, 1920, mm -hmm. and bingo, and 41 were back at it. And it seemed so long at that time, as opposed to the time expanse here from the war till today. And I look at that, and it's hard to compute in my head about how the kids react compared to how I reacted back mm -hmm. then. When you were kind of bouncing around between business schools, did you have help from the GI Bill? Oh, yep. it was all GI. Okay. In recent times, by the way, I've taken advantage of the VA. And up until recently, and even now, locally, the uh, Massachusetts VA has been very good. And I use the Framingham group here, mm -hmm. and they've been very good. I needed them somewhere else once. I walked in and uh, it was like, we don't know you who you are. And they could have gone on the computer. I'm in the computer, I have my number. Uh, they have my history on everything I've ever done. Mm -hmm. And uh, I couldn't get them to talk to me even. I, I, I know why people are complaining. Mm -hmm. It's not a problem for me, but I can understand what's happening out there. Mm -hmm. And did your, any of your children uh, join the military? No, not yet. Any of your grandsons? Not yet. Okay. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> Jerry, is there anything else you'd like to say, uh, such as um, how important was it for you to serve in the military? Oh, I, it, was, it did everything for me because mm -hmm. of uh, Frank Screws. But, uh, you know, there's... I have no idea where I'd have been if it weren't for that guy sending me mm -hmm. off to officer's training and meeting the people I met, and doing what I did. The training, uh, yeah, the radio was good, the radar was good, it, so it was my background for getting into electronics. <laughs> we were manufacturer's reps and represented some marvelous companies. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you'd like to say? No, I think I've done it all. The family's very complimentary to me. They take mm -hmm. care of me well. I, I, I have no complaints. I'm very mm -hmm. pleased and excited about my whole life. Mm -hmm. Jerry Rosen, thank you so much for coming in and taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Pleasure meeting you, Maureen. Yeah. And you too, Dan. <laughs>